thank you everyone for coming back from the break. I know it's difficult to end those conversations and, and to get back in gear. And I'd certainly also like to thank Micronutrients for inviting me to come present today. It's another reason I, I do want to thank you. I, I come from Saskatchewan in, in Canada, fairly northern climate. If you look at the weather forecast in Saskatoon over the last three days, we've been hovering around minus 40 degrees Celsius. And if you incorporate the wind, we're around minus 50 to minus 53. Uh, Celsius, so in the 60s, negative Fahrenheit. Uh, so Arizona is by far a better place to be uh, than in Saskatoon. Today. What I want to talk to you today uh, is about uh, rumen health and, and uh, gut health uh, as related to rumen function. And what I'm going to do is utilize low feed intake as a model to help us understand uh, the impact. So I'm really glad that Dr. Harvatin talked about research models and the strengths and the limitations with those models and how conditions impact our ability to make conclusions. And I'm also going to bring in some issues or areas that Dr. Oba talked about, uh, specifically looking at low feed intake. So before getting started, I just want to remind you, I guess, what we expect out of the gastrointestinal tract from its core uh, essential functions. And so classically, we focused on the gastrointestinal tract as being the site for nutrient digestion, absorption, and then secretory functions. So obviously, feed digestion, we know now that nutrient absorption, at least from the rumen standpoint, regulates ruminal pH. Nutrient absorption is obviously critical if we're going to convert those dietary nutrients into productive outcomes or maintenance outcomes. And then we need to also think about urea recycling from the secretory perspective. Areas that have gotten a lot of attention in the last decade uh, have focused on barrier function and recognizing that the gastrointestinal tract has the largest surface area of exposure to organisms that could potentially induce harmful effects. And so the gastrointestinal tract, or that epithelial barrier function, really functions as the first arm of the immune response to hopefully prevent or control uh, pathogen and antigen movement across that gastrointestinal tract. So we can think about this from a number of uh, different perspectives. We can think of intrinsic factors, so secretory compounds like mucus that help limit the ability of those microbes to gain access. We can think about extrinsic factors, so the structural features of the epithelium. And then we can also consider immunological factors, so again, secretory compounds that the gastrointestinal tract secretes that may actually have antimicrobial uh, capability. Another area that we need to think about, or hopefully at least not lose sight in, is that the gut, the microbes, and the host collectively are all communicating. And so there is local crosstalk that occurs across the gastrointestinal tract. There is nutrient signaling and nutrient sensing in terms of the gastrointestinal tract observing and detecting and responding, making endocrine uh, responses that affect animal behavior from an eating perspective, but also from an immunological perspective and a stress response. So the gut is doing a lot more than just holding the digesta, propelling it through, and facilitating that digestion and absorption. It also needs to make sure that we have selective nutrient absorption, preventing harmful molecules from crossing, and then continually sensing that luminal environment to make sure uh, things are occurring in a state that allows for homeostatic mechanisms. I want to emphasize that some of the things we do under normal production practices might actually compromise the ability of the gut to maintain these uh, essential functions. This is an experiment we uh, published a few years ago. We had 14 Holstein bull calves in this experiment. We weaned them on day 42 after a seven-day step-down weaning program. So we were trying to impose a weaning program that we would typically see in industry. We thought it was relatively gradual. And so what I'm going to show you is animals that were either not weaned, so they did not go through that seven-day step-down period, or animals that were weaned. Sorry, I went too far. OK. So first of all, if you look at milk replacer intake, we did exactly what we would expect. Milk replacer intake was increasing as those calves grew. We imposed that seven-day 
weaning protocol, drop milk replacer intake, week seven they wouldn't have had any, not shown on this diagram, and in response to that reduction in milk replacer, starter intake increased. Okay, so we saw a classical response from an increase in starter intake and a reduction in milk yield, but what we were really interested in is understanding the response of the gut to this nutritional challenge, and I'm gonna argue this is a nutritional challenge. So we used chromium EDTA as a total gastrointestinal permeability marker. So the concept with chromium EDTA is it stays in a, a chelated form or a complex form. It is a very large molecule and should not cross the gut through absorptive processes. So if it crosses the gut, we assume that it's crossing the gut between cells, indicating that that tissue is more permeable or has lower barrier function. So if you look at the data, what we're looking at is urinary chromium excretion. So chromium that crossed the gut will be cleared by the kidney and will show up in urine. And so higher values are negative in terms of its response for permeability. So we saw a few really important outcomes with this experiment. First of all, if we just look at the black bars, so our group that was not weaned, it looks like we have an age-related response in terms of permeability. Now, as Dr. Harvatine mentioned, this is completely confounded by time, okay? So we can't prove for sure if it's an age response or a time response, but at least we see a general reduction as those animals uh, advance in age. Now, the, the challenging side is when we impose that gradual seven-day weaning protocol, we massively disrupted that permeability, or we increase permeability simply by shifting the diet from a milk-based diet with concentrate to a diet that was essentially all starter. So something that we do in the field regularly and we may perceive as being a fairly safe practice actually can induce some fairly large changes in the ability of the gut to maintain an effective barrier. So why does this matter? Well, if you think of transition dairy cattle, and I'm a multi, uh, I'm a ruminant guy, but I, I deal with the multiple production scenarios. So this is data actually from uh, my master's study where we were looking at dry matter intake and recovery responses, very similar to what Dr. Oba was talking about. And if you look at the general means, we see about a reduction in dry matter intake that was nearly 30%. Now this is very consistent with what has been reported in the literature, about a 30% uh, reduction in dry matter intake and almost 90% of that occurs in the last week. Maybe with the low energy diets, uh, close up, we're seeing less of a reduction, but nevertheless, if you have cattle that have mastitis or metritis or ketosis, we definitely see a reduction in dry matter intake for those cattle. If you're looking on the beef side or you're dealing with cattle that are moving across locations, we have another stressful impact related to transportation, and this is simply data looking at dry matter intake for feedlot cattle based on week of placement uh, in the feedlot where during that first week at, at arrival or upon arrival, they're only eating between 0.5 and 1.5% of body weight. So if they're down in that 0.5% range, they're only eating 25% of what we would expect them to consume. And it gradually increases over time. So it looks like we have a number of production scenarios in industry where cattle are experiencing low feed intake for five to seven days uh, roughly. What do we know? Well, we do know already that although gut adaptation from a promotion standpoint takes significant time, we can have very rapid retrogressive effects. So imposing 48 hours of complete feed withdrawal has been reported to decrease short chain fatty acid absorption across the rumen by approximately 50%. So 48 hours with no feed, and about a 50% reduction in the capability of that tissue to absorb those short chain fatty acids. Now that's great, but hopefully we're not gonna see situations where cattle are completely uh, exposed to no feed. And I think dealing with low feed intake is a more representative situation of what we will see in industry. So we set out a, a few experiments. At this time, we really didn't know a lot about low feed intake and the impact of low feed intake on gut function. So we used a, a strange model from a dairy perspective, uh, but it was a model that allowed us to eliminate a whole bunch of noise so we could simply look at the effect of low feed intake. 
So we had 18 cannulated heifers, and we assigned them to three treatments. 75% of their ad libitum intake, 50% or 25%, so that we could address the severity response of that low feed intake on gut function. Okay, pretty moderate, uh, moderately fermentable diet, and the experiment was arranged with five different periods. We had a baseline period of seven days, followed by five days of feed restriction, and then three consecutive weeks of recovery. So how we used this data was first to understand the impact of low feed intake on gastrointestinal tract function. And that's important to understand, but the reality in the in industry or in the field is that hopefully those cattle recover and we need to have an understanding of those recovery response dynamics. So by utilizing the feed restriction period coupled with the three weeks of recovery, we were looking to try to understand that rate of recovery in a long-term goal to try to evaluate strategies that help us accelerate the recovery response or mitigate the negative effect if that feed restriction event is predictable. So what do we know? Well, this shouldn't be very surprising, and this is completely in response to our treatment exposure. As expected, we reduced dry matter intake, right? That was the whole treatment approach. So I'm just showing you that my student did actually uh, reduce dry matter intake sufficiently. And again, not surprisingly, when you reduce dry matter intake, you decrease short chain fatty acid concentration in the rumen. This should not be surprising, right? We're just decreasing the amount of fermentable material entering the rumen. The flip side of that is if we measure rumen pH, we can see that rumen pH increases during low feed intake and it does so in a dose dependent fashion. So the greater the reduction in dry matter intake, the greater the increase in ruminal pH. And I, I like to use this slide to point out a couple issues. First of all, we often talk about rumen pH as being this negative issue. And Dr. Obo was talking about rumen acidosis in relation to dietary transition. I think we need to be wise and recognize high pH does not mean that animal is in a positive condition. The easiest way to have high pH is to have an animal that is not eating. Okay, that's not a productive state. Okay, if we want to look at it from an acidotic perspective, feed restriction decreases risk for pH being below 5.5 or 5.8. Okay, so why does this matter? Well, we use an approach called the temporary isolated washed reticular rumen approach. So this is a very artificial approach where we evacuate the rumen contents, we wash out the rumen, we occlude the esophagus so that no saliva can enter the rumen, and we occlude the omasal orifice so no buffer or fluid can leave the rumen unless it crosses the rumen wall. Okay, so we've effectively isolated the reticular rumen in the live animal, allowing us to put in a buffer with a known chemical composition, a known volume, and a known concentration of a fluid volume marker, and then we can use that to calculate nutrient disappearance, which we assume is nutrient absorption. So I showed you that short-chain fatty acid concentration differed by treatment. When we measured the response in the washed reticular rumen approach, we held the short-chain fatty acid concentration static across all cattle. So looking at these outcomes, we're looking at the impact of low feed intake and not the confounding factor of low feed intake and lower short chain fatty acid concentration. Okay, so what did we see? Well, first of all, it's only a tendency, but I think this is a real response where low feed intake, and this is five days of low feed intake, decreased absorptive potential of that rumen epithelium and it tended to do so in a dose-dependent manner. So let's think about this back in context of transition dairy cattle. Those cattle that go off feed to the greatest extent are probably the most vulnerable or more sensitive cattle. They will have less short-chain fatty acids in the rumen because dry matter intake is reduced, and although they may have a greater energy and protein requirement, their ability to absorb short-chain fatty acids is likely compromised. So it's kind of that double whammy where they have low feed intake, low energy availability, and their gastrointestinal tract is also responding, saying I'm not going to be able to absorb a lot of those nutrients that potentially could be used. Okay, so absorptive function is definitely critical. What happens in terms of barrier function? 
So we had baseline measurements, and then we had the measurement conducted on day three and day four of our feed restriction period. And we can see that those animals that were restricted to 25% of their dry matter intake had compromised barrier function. Okay? And so again, we're putting those cattle in a situation where low feed intake is already compromising nutrient supply, but we're also creating conditions in the gastrointestinal tract that may be increasing nutrient demand if antigens or pathogenic organisms are crossing that gastrointestinal tract. Okay? Remember in this model, and I, I emphasized it at the beginning, we used non-pregnant Angus heifers. Okay? And all we did was impose a feed restriction event. And what we found was after allowing those cattle free access to their diet, the rate of dry matter increase was dependent on the severity of the feed restriction event. Okay, and surprisingly, this, this actually fits fairly well, not from a total kilos of dry matter intake uh, perspective, but from a rate of response or rate of increase to transition dairy cattle that also go through a period of low feed intake. Okay? So there's a lot of factors going on, and we've used this model to try to help better understand uh, that impact of low feed intake. So the other thing I want to highlight is during week one, we're definitely not at a place where dry matter intake is high. Okay, so we have a diet that was 60% uh, forage, 40% concentrate from a very crude standpoint, low dry matter intake, but allowing them access to that diet after feed restriction induces ruminacidosis. So mean pH values in the 5.85 to uh, 5.9 range for those cattle that were more severely restricted. Okay? And we really do think this response for increased susceptibility to ruminal acidosis is because we decrease the ability of that rumen to absorb those short chain fatty acids, which means there is less buffering potential coming from the rumen epithelium and greater ability to drop that rumen pH. Looking at this in another way, and again, this isn't a slug feeding response because dry matter intake was low, but we see the amount of time that those cattle spent below pH 5.5 was roughly six hours per day in that first week at a time where pH is our, or dry matter intake is low. So think about this again from a transition cow perspective where we're not only just changing feed intake level, but we're also changing diet fermentability and gut activity, and we're increasing the risk for uh, ruminal acidosis. Okay. If we look at short chain fatty acid absorption rates, we monitored, monitored that recovery time. A little bit of noise in the data here, but what it generally shows, or our general conclusion, is again, the severity of that low feed intake impacts the rate of increase for those animals to be able to absorb nutrients. So the greater the severity of that feed intake reduction, the longer delay in terms of recovery for uh, short chain fatty acid absorption. And those animals that were severely restricted still have compromised barrier function even three weeks after the low feed intake period. So we're really setting them up by allowing cattle or not trying to minimize the uh, severity of that low feed intake period. It really is set setting up cattle for some challenges in terms of uh, barrier function. Now, one of the uh, issues we have here with urinary chromium is we're ruminally dosing the chromium and we're measuring it in urine, so we really don't know the region of the gastrointestinal tract uh, that the chromium is crossing. And if you think about this from a, a histological perspective, this is a cartoon that Dr. Mike Steele put in a review paper a few years back now. We can look at some of the extrinsic and intrinsic factors uh, that differ in terms of ability to maintain barrier function between ruminal tissue and intestinal tissue. So hopefully the first thing you realize is that the rumen epithelium is stratified. There are multiple cell layers, multi multiple different individual strata as you move from the basal membrane out to the lumen. Okay. From a barrier function perspective, it's really the granulosum and the spinosum that contain tight cell junctions and actually have that uh, uh, extrinsic barrier function practice. The stratum corneum likely functions primarily to 
protect that underlying tissue from abrasive forces in the rumen. We know there is extensive microbial colonization uh, of this layer as well. But from a secretory standpoint, we consider the rumen epithelium really to be non-secretory in nature. So no mucus secretion, and we question or currently don't think that there are any microbial uh, secretions across uh, that rumen epithelium. If you compare that to the intestinal epithelium, well, now you have a very different cell structure. So a single layer of epithelial cells, which would likely seem more risky than a multi-layer. But there's other comp comp compensatory mechanisms, an outer mucus layer, an inner mucus layer, and significant secretions of antimicrobial uh, components. So very different ways of trying to regulate what's crossing and who's crossing, uh, but we really don't know which regions of the gastrointestinal tract are more sensitive to some of these challenges. Why does this matter? Well, if we're trying to develop strategies to minimize the impact, I need to understand where I need to deliver those compounds. If it's an intestinal response, we may have to deliver protected compounds. If it's a ruminal response, we need to think about how to get across that rumen epithelium. Okay, so this brings us uh, to barrier function, and I'm just gonna highlight kind of what happens in the intestinal epithelium. The same processes also occur in the rumen epithelium, but we really have three different places within that tissue where we have complexes that help prevent molecule passage across that tissue and help cells communicate with each other, okay? So we can have tight junctions that are located primarily uh, fairly close to the apical layer. And these tight junctions are, you could consider them like the mortar that holds cement blocks together. Okay, these cells are not attached other than these interlocking proteins that extend through the cell membrane and anchor cells to one another. So they create a, a spider web or a, a, a mortar that is partially porous, but is restrictive, we think, primarily in size. So small molecules have the ability to pass through those pores to a greater extent than large molecules. Okay, we can have adherin and cadherin junctions that are also there to help maintain some of that uh, barrier function response. And then we have desmosomes or gap junctions that help transfer nutrients between cells and help with cell-to-cell -cell communication. So the general process is we want to promote nutrient transport that goes transcellularly or through the cells and try to avoid or limit the movement of compounds between cells, which we would call paracellular movement. Okay, and the paracellular movement is really what we're getting at when we're talking about barrier function. So when we had higher chromium appearing in the urine, the assumption is that chromium EDTA is actually crossing between cells, passing those tight cell junctions and those adherent junctions and entering portal circulation rather than going through cells through transport processes, okay? So we're really looking at the ability of cells to restrict the movement of large molecules across that tissue. So this works really well in, in healthy or modestly challenged epithelium, and Dr. Harvatine talked about hitting things with a hammer, and if we impose very severe challenges, we can hit the rumen with a hammer, and hopefully what you can see, although it's kind of disgusting, is we have the inside of the rumen epithelium. You can see regions where papillae have been eroded off and regions where we have active lesions, okay? Tight cell junctions don't matter in this case because there is direct access uh, to arterial and portal blood flow, okay? So when we're talking about tight cell junction-related permeability, we're not trying to focus on this issue. We're trying to focus on what would appear to be uh, intact epithelium. Certainly, when we have this kind of situation, cattle are much more prone to secondary disorders like liver abscesses, and certainly there's a very high rate of liver abscesses that occur in uh, dairy cattle. So I've, I've highlighted that different regions of the gastrointestinal tract have different structures and different mechanisms to try to support barrier function. How do those regions differ? And until uh, until we did this work, there really was no regional characterization of barrier function across the gastrointestinal tract. 
So I'm just showing you the movement of one molecule, mannitol. Mannitol is a pretty small molecule, not the best indicator of paracellular movement, but it helps highlight a couple of trends. First of all, the rumen and the omasum, both of those tissues are stratified tissues. Okay? They have very low permeability. And this fits the general concept that has been proposed for monogastrics, humans, and rats, where areas that have high microbial colonization and high risk for uh, antigen movement should be tight epithelia. Okay, so the rumen and the omasum are generally tight. We see that permeability increases as we move into the small intestine, and then permeability, again, generally decreases as we move to the large intestine. So why does this matter? Well, when you look at most experimental models, especially rumen acidosis models, we're typically measuring responses in the rumen. Why? Well, it's a very large site in terms of uh, physical capacity. It's really important from a fermentation standpoint, but it's not very immunoreactive, okay? And I think we're doing it in many cases because it's an easy site to access and an easy site to measure, okay? Our data suggests that maybe we need to pay a lot more attention to the small intestine and the large intestine and maybe have less focus, not ignore the rumen, but less focus uh, on the rumen. We're not the only ones that have suggested that. So out of uh, Dr. Baumgard's group, uh, Dr. Uh, Videra is here today. They imposed a feed restriction model in dairy cattle. I'm not showing you the milk yield response, but milk yield basically followed the reduction in dry matter intake. Okay, and when they imposed this response, uh, they saw increased endotoxin concentration in blood, and they saw generally increased concentrations of serum amyloid A, which would be an indicator for a generalized systemic but low-grade uh, inflammatory response. Okay, what else do they see happening? Well, in this case, they were looking at the jejunum, and they showed that exposure to low feed intake decreased uh, villus width, decreased villus depth, okay, in both the jejunum uh, and in the ileum. Okay, so they're showing that five days of exposure to low feed intake is not just affecting what's going on in the rumen, it's also affecting what's going on in two very critical regions of the small intestine that are loaded with uh, connections to the immune system. So we wanted to get a, a better handle of this and try to understand which regions of the gastrointestinal tract were most affected to two common nutritional challenges. So we had our control treatment, or we had a treatment where we induced ruminal acidosis, and then another treatment where we imposed low feed intake. So we're not trying to compare low feed intake to ruminal acidosis. We just use these two nutritional challenges because we felt that they're common in industry and represent normal physiological events that cattle are faced, okay? So not very special in terms of the diet. This is really a model to have a modest, moderately fermentable diet and try to understand the impacts of rumen acidosis and low feed intake. So this was our experimental paradigm where we had our control animals that basically went through all the same sampling approaches but did not have any nutritional challenge put in place. We had animals that were exposed to ruminal acidosis, so we withheld feed for one day at 25%, and then we overfed grain, and we killed those animals uh, two days later. Or we exposed them to low feed intake, where we restricted feed intake to 25%, uh, and then we killed those animals five days later. So what did we look, look for? Well, we saw that uh, from a body weight perspective, it shouldn't be that surprising. Low feed intake decreased body weight, both low feed intake and ruminal acidosis decrease dry matter intake based on the context of this model. And, and it's not that surprising. A typical response for cattle that are exposed to ruminal acidosis is to drop intake. And that's one mechanism that they use to help stabilize dry matter intake. So the low feed intake response is simply an artifact of our model for that low feed intake treatment. Okay. What's happening in terms of luminal pH and, and Dr. Gressley is going to talk about hindgut acidosis. This is a model supporting some of the concepts that I think she'll show where when we induce ruminal acidosis uh, in the rumen, we also are dropping pH in the cecum and the proximal colon, okay, and tending to drop pH in the distal colon. 
So we're seeing effects from ruminal acidosis that are not just affecting the rumen, they're also affecting more distal parts of the gastrointestinal tract. If we look at the impact of low feed intake, we can see that low feed intake increases pH relative to the control in the rumen, and we can also pick that up in the colon. Okay, so again, we're changing luminal conditions more broadly than just uh, within the rumen. We were looking at short-chain fatty acid concentrations in that digesta. When you drop feed intake, again, with rumen acidosis or a low feed intake challenge, we decrease those short-chain fatty acids most prominently in the rumen, but numerical reductions can be observed uh, in other regions where we would expect more fermentation. Okay. We can also drastically change surface area of the rumen epithelium. So this is probably one of the mechanisms why we see lower short-chain fatty acid transport in response to low feed intake. And what's really challenging or exciting about this is if you would look at the, the timeline required to stimulate an increase in surface area, we would expect that it takes somewhere between four and six weeks. Yet five days, and we can have very drastic reductions in the surface area. So it looks like proliferative action is far more delayed than retrogressive adaptation. Okay. We used inulin flux as one of our permeability markers, so this was all measured ex vivo. And when we measure this response ex vivo, we actually have some outcomes that I certainly did not expect, and I want to talk about some of the limitations with this model, uh, given the spirit of uh, Dr. Harvatine's talk. So first of all, let's go through it. You can see the regions of the gastrointestinal tract that we cultured, ex vivo. We don't see any differences until we get into the distal colon. And we actually see that inulin flux is lower, which would tell us that the distal colon is actually more tight, less permeable in animals that were exposed to low feed intake or ruminal acidosis. So this is going completely against what I've been telling you for the last 34 minutes or 35 minutes where I've been arguing that ruminal acidosis may increase permeability and low feed intake increases permeability. But I really think this is an artifact of our model because we need to make sure we have viable tissues in our ex vivo system. So what prevents me from having viable tissues? Any tissues that have visible lesions, when I mount them, I cannot confirm that those are viable tissues. So I have to exclude them. So through our experimental model, we've artificially selected tissues that from a physical appearance actually look to be intact. And when we measure that response, they tend to be uh, less permeable than our control tissues. Manitol really showed the same thing, just perhaps a little more evident. Again, we're seeing big changes in permeability in the large intestine. So again, those permeability responses are going in the wrong way, but I think we can explain that not only on our experimental model, but also uh, other results that I'm going to share with you. Point I want to make is not necessarily the nature of that change, but in these uh, challenge models that we're imposing, we're proving the concept that other regions outside of the rumen can be strongly affected. Okay, so they're not going in the way that our hypothesis suggested, but we are certainly impacting permeability of the large intestine. Okay. Why do I think we can explain that? Well, we also looked at gene expression, and we looked at gene expression for a number of our tight cell junction proteins, and we looked at toll-like receptor 2 and toll-like receptor uh, 4. This is for ruminal tissue, and as I mentioned, we had less permeable uh, tissues in general for our, our low feed intake period or treatment, and you can see we typically have greater expression of these tight cell junction proteins. So while one example or one implication could be our experimental approach compromised our ability to see greater permeability, we also need to think about the timeline of the response. And I'm going to show you a, a timeline proposal that we've put in a recent review paper in Journal Dairy Science that looks at how that gut responds to challenges and may actually uh, give us more things to consider when we're evaluating experimental design because the day of sampling relative to the initiation of that challenge can really change our outcome uh, and the interpretation of those outcomes. So 
With low feed intake, we did see increased clodin, occludin, zona occludin 1, zona occludin 2, and increased toll-like receptor 4. Toll-like receptor 4 is really interesting because one of its ligands, or its primary ligand, is lipopolysaccharide, or LPS. So it's increasing its expression uh, in the rumen. If you look at this in the duodenum, again, we see a very similar response. Increased clodin, increased occludin, okay, increased zona occludin, increased zona occludin 2, increased TLL4, TLR4, and this is uh, a receptor that detects uh, IgA, so an immunoglobulin secreted by the intestine, and it goes way up for these low feed intake uh, tissues. So again, the nature of the response is not following our hypothesis, but I hope what I'm convincing you is that the small intestine and the large intestine are really responding to these nutritional challenges. I won't go over this uh, too much more from a large intestine standpoint, but the responses were very con uh, consistent where we increased the expression of our tight cell junctions uh, related proteins and TLR4. And I do think, and we'll get to this later, that part of the response is due to when we collected the samples. So we've been able to show negative effects, and if I go to our local funding industries and I just say I can show you lots of negative effects that happen in production, they're going to say, great, we gave you money, now go away. So what we've been working to do is try to figure out whether or not we can actually accelerate recovery of the gastrointestinal tract following these nutritional challenges. And we looked at a number of different compounds, so we use butyrate, there's lots of data showing butyrate stimulates proliferation of many regions of the gastrointestinal tract. It stimulates potentially GLP-2 uh, release, so it can uh, initiate responses through luminal nutrient sensing. Betaine has been shown in some experimental models to be helpful in terms of uh, protection from coccidiosis. And then antioxidants do also play a role within the gastrointestinal tract and may help stabilize or reduce risk for oxidative stress uh, for those epithelial tissues. So similar experimental design, in this case we used sheep, and what we were exposing these sheep was uh, to a finishing relevant diet, so only 9% barley silage on a dry matter basis. After the challenge, we imposed the concept of reducing the amount of grain in the diet, increasing the amount of forage, or reducing the amount of grain, increasing forage, and uh, providing our rumen protected betaine, our antioxidant, and our uh, butyrate. Again, dose rates are very low based on uh, previous studies. Our experimental design included a baseline period, a period for low feed intake. So this was three days of low feed intake, followed by recovery, and the recovery was where we imposed our treatments. I just want to highlight a couple things. I, I don't think this study provides enough depth for any mechanistic understanding, but it provides proof of concept that we can use nutritional tools to help modulate gastrointestinal tract recovery. So if you look at acetate absorption across uh, the rumen epithelium, we can see a tendency for improvements when we included that cocktail compound, and for butyrate it was statistically improved. So providing compounds that may be functional nutrients or functionally detected by cells may help us uh, regulate or uh, moderate that recovery response. Okay, Manitol flux again, opposite to what we would have expected where we have lower mannitol flux in our challenged uh, treatments it, within the rumen and no effect for other regions. Okay, so a little different response than we saw in previous studies. I really need the experimental animals to read the previous paper before we conduct the next experiment and hopefully they'll respond uh, more similarly next time. Just like we saw though, in general when we look at our tight cell junction related proteins, we see increased expression in those tissues that had lower permeability. So I think we can explain why we had lower permeability, and what I think we need to start thinking about is the timeline of the recovery response. So I showed you uh, low feed intake uh, data from several experiments. The challenge is we use different experimental timelines and different models in those experiments, and we do this from a robustness standpoint to make sure that our outcomes uh, are, are repeatable, but in general we impose ad libitum dry matter intake, we restrict dry matter intake, and then we allow those cattle or sheep to recover. And this is the general slope response that we see at least 
uh, without a dietary change imposed in that model. Okay, our results have suggested that in response to that low feed intake, we start out with relatively high absorptive capacity. It declines, and it declines fairly rapidly. And then it increases, but it increases at a rate that lags behind dry matter intake. Okay, so from a recovery standpoint, cattle are recovering their absorptive capacity, but they're recovering it at a rate that is slower than dry matter intake. The other aspect that I was touching on was permeability. Okay, and I, I really should uh, call this barrier function. So initially we have adequate barrier function. Barrier function decreases or permeability actually goes up. And then we see a recovery or a resolution event where that permeability is restored or barrier function uh, is restored. So we think that this helps explain why we're seeing this differential response where if we take a, a measurement that's occurring during the low feed intake period, like we do with our chromium EDTA, we can detect that uh, lower barrier function. Yet if we take a measurement that occurs somewhere in the recovery phase, we may actually already be dealing with compensatory mechanisms and we see barrier function uh, that is actually improved. So what does this all mean? I hope what I've done is convinced you that the gastrointestinal tract is responding to nutritional challenges and it's re responding throughout the gastrointestinal tract. I use low feed intake and I really do think low feed intake is an underappreciated nutritional challenge. How does the gut respond? Well, in response to lower nutrient supply, we see reductions in surface area, so changes in morphology. We see reduced absorptive uh, capacity. We see compromised barrier function and all this leads to increased risk for inflammation. And I didn't get into the inflammatory response uh, to uh, any great extent. And I think what we need to do now is quit focusing on the effect of low feed intake, but start working towards understanding factors that help cattle recover and hopefully accelerate that recovery uh, of low feed intake. So thanks for your attention. And, and with that, I'd be happy to address uh, any questions you may have. Yeah, we, uh, we do have uh, several questions here. The first question is, where do you think the most potential is for us to improve overall rumen function and health as an industry, such as nutrition interventions, genetics, microbial management, et cetera? To be honest, I, I think it's probably not nutritional uh, mediated. I think it's a management response. So when do we see times of low feed intake if we're overstocking at the feed bunk? or we're imposing transportation events, or housing conditions that are not mitigating heat stress, they cause us to have to look for strategies that hopefully help prevent the impact or accelerate the response. So I think we can use nutritional tools to help the gut respond, but if we do a better job as managers, we probably need those tools uh, to a lower extent. Thank you. The uh, second question here is, what is the mode of action for the re reduced short-chain fatty acid absorption with feed restriction? Yeah, so the, the mode of action for reduced absorptive capacity, I think some of it is related to uh, reductions in surface area. I think some of it is related to reductions in blood flow. And I think collectively those will explain or, or help settle uh, why we see lower rates of short-chain fatty acid uh, transport. The other issue that we have going on at the same time, and, and we've looked at this from the other standpoint, so increasing rates, is we can see very rapid increases in cellular activity in response to a diet change. And so we often think of surface area driving the response, but we need to think that those epithelial tissues are turning over somewhere between every two and 10 days, if we're talking about the rumen. And so very abrupt dietary changes can induce very large functional changes in, in individual cells. Okay. Uh, another question here, in the calf study that you shared uh, earlier in your presentation, um, how much reduction in dry matter intake during the seven days when starter intake was increasing at the same time? And is the chromium response due to the change in rumen versus small, intestine, uh, small intestinal barrier? That's, that's a great question. I don't remember the data off the top of my head. I think it was about a 70% or dry matter intake, total dry matter intake, considering starter dry matter intake and milk replacer dry matter intake was about 70% of what it was 
in the calves that were not weaned. And unfortunately, with the chromium EDTA approach, we have no clue what regions are responding, whether it's a, a rumen acidosis response from higher starter intake and an abrupt increase in starter intake, or if we're seeing more distal effects uh, in the large intestine. Unfortunately, we didn't take enough samples in that study to really determine the, the region of the response. Okay. Um, <clears throat> another one here, which is more important in regard to the overall topic that you're discussing today, rumen health or lower GI health? So if you, if you include the small intestine as lower GI health, I would argue it's probably lower GI and less on the rumen. Um, one last question here. Um, sorry, they moved on me here. Um, what was the actual decrease in feed intake used for in the, in the low feed intake animals, and is there a tipping point to this level? Yes, yeah, so we use three different severities, um, and then Dr. Baumgart has used uh, four different severities. So we've gone between 75, 50, and 25 percent of their regular dry matter intake. So that would be up to a 75% reduction in dry matter intake. Uh, Dr. Baumgard's group has gone uh, to an 80% reduction in dry matter intake. We tend to see greater responses once we cross that 75% uh, reduction uh, threshold. So 75%, certainly we can detect some responses, but they're fairly subtle. Once we get into 50 or 25%, those response, uh, the magnitude of the response is much larger. All right, let's thank Dr. Pinner again.